so there we go that's these are my details and this is what we're gonna cover here okay let's just delve into uh the business right any question before i just move on you all okay you can hear me clearly perfect yes i can hear it all great excellent wonderful right so when i do the training when uh, well, i thought i mentioned something about what we have so Aruba is not switches, Aruba is not wireless only, Aruba is not controllers only, Aruba is not only management, it's an amalgamation of things. So the product line, we have multi things or multi kind of uh, discipline, if you like. Uh, quickly, very quickly, switches as we know them, and mainly now we have CX platform, and uh, we have uh, Aruba OS platform. There is kind of office connect, they call it. So entry level consumer grade uh, switches. They now call this one legacy. So if you hear legacy, they mean Aruba OS, which is based on X provision devices. Okay, that's it. Simple. Future is CX. That's it. Now and the future. Airwave is on prem management, probably. Remedian is location uh, application. Central is on cl uh, cloud-based management, which is going to be the platform to go for everything. Yeah. Um, Activate is a cloud uh, provisioning service that communicates with Central back and forth. Devices will communicate with Activate to do things like zero touch provisioning, for example. NetInsight is about security. Now, the functionality of Dit Insight, Aruba Insight, is being integrated and integrated with Central. So, Central has all the intelligence now uh, to be able to do troubleshooting, uh, AI Insight, and so on. Um, controllers, as you might appreciate, uh, are the mechanisms or the devices or appliances that were the access point being managed. So, access point connector controllers in a tunnel and um, these access points can be remote APs or can be campus APs. Right, moving on. AP is different models. Obviously, there are 600 series now. Uh, .11AX, I, let's call it Wave 2 or Enhancements. Um, then you have remote AP. You have VPN uh, server, uh, VPN agent. You have NAC solution, as we have explained. And we have the outdoor out uh, AP. If you look at the actual uh, product line when it comes to um, to uh, controllers, you can see range of controllers being for small to medium sized businesses to large enterprises and a lot of features here. We're talking about the management of the management, which is mobility master. Now we call it mobility conductor. Uh, our focus is not this area at all, but at least I uh, put this in uh, in the context of what devices does Aruba have got in here. The switches, which is the topic of this training, CX switches. Now, what you see here, you see a mix of different switches. You see a mix between CX and the legacy. So these guys are the legacy ones. Again, of course, you always double check with end of service and all that stuff. So this is now done gone yeah 25 um being replaced by 6000 series 6000 uh, 4100 4100i um you need to update yourself with the rest of the portfolio many more switches became available like 6200 we have 6100 we have 6000 series we have 4100i um we have 8320 we have 8325, 8360. Uh, we have 10,000 series. The, this is a completely different platform, different monster. And we have the recent one is 9300 switch. So um, a lot of uh, update being done. A lot of focus on data center as well as on the edges, as well a complete solution, campus as well as uh, data center solution. Um, we have things like to do with the network security, which basically mainly talking about um, clear pass, as we said before. Uh, one of the other things is the user experience, for example, is a product that has um, is now has become part of Aruba uh, portfolio. And it is about troubleshooting and feedback to the user uh, based on the uh, analytical capability. It has um, a platform on the cloud. 
uh, it's right now it still has its own platform on the cloud um, in the future that will be completely integrated with the uh, Aruba uh, uh, central service yeah um, as we said our focus is the switching so we're going to look at the switching here now we have again just you know where to position the switch depends on how large how complex your network is um, we have these kind of switches for aggregation axis layer switches modular switches um, fixed port top of the rack switches or spine and leaf we talk about the leaf at the top of the rack switches in the spine and leaf stuff and 64 8400 is campus core as well as data center core or data center spine if you would like to do uh, go that route um, we'll come back to the stacking later on but uh, it's worth mentioning in my view that um, there are different types of stacking like in any vendor most vendors they have different platforms uh, some platforms they have manufactured themselves some legacy platforms some platforms that have been acquired from other vendors um, so for example, we have two kind of technologies here, uh, VSF and backplane stacking. These are the legacy Aruba OS, which is you can all you see all this platform. This is gone, this is nearly gone, and this is still um, around being sold and so on. These are extremely powerful switches. When it comes to the CX platform, uh, that's just an example of you might what you might come across in the CX platform. So we have also the support for VSF. Okay, so mainly 63, 6200 are VSF capable. Uh, you cannot mix a match between Aruba OS and the CX, which is in terms of um, uh, stacking VSF. So that is not possible. VSX is called dual control plane stacking. Now, um, of course, to find the details of that, you need to look at the data sheet, uh, data sheet of each, each one of these platforms and find out what is going on. If you look at the switch architecture itself, now it's extremely modular um, and it is based on databases, if you like. So we have the configuration state database, configuration state database, right? Um, uh, we have time series database, okay we have the analytics engine that you're running agents which we will explain more when we get to that module now we have rest api that integrates with external stuff so if i need to send instructions using rest api like a net edit then i will use the rest api capability on these switches to communicate whatever instructions to read from or to make changes and uh, i think that would be more manifested when we talk about net edit and we'll get to that point so configuration as the name indicates is configuration time series real-time visibility so basically every five seconds there will be interaction between the configuration database and the time series database is is a real-time kind of update agents are running uh, to execute certain um, uh, certain actions intelligence and automation using REST API. So you might have a piece of code that is written in Python, and that might be integrated with um, some, or, some sort of uh, dashboard or some sort of uh, automation process that I can communicate with the system, i.e. with a switch, using REST API commands to read and make changes. Uh, here, sandbox isolation it means um, what happens in any process will not impact other processes. So in Sandbox, the, you know, the term, the, we use it in email stuff when we need to filter email. So we create an environment that mimics the real environment and we will test. If the test successful, we will execute the command. If the test unsuccessful, then we will drop the command. I might send that back a message and so on. Flexible actions. So this is something that you can customize what action in the network analytics engine should an event or a condition arise uh, then what kind of action or actions that we would like uh, to take just this is just quickly to show you the evolution if you like um, and again this is um, i'm not going to waste your time on that one 
uh, evolution of the platform, where we came from and where we ended up now. Obviously, there are more to come. Now, one of the things that I would like just to uh, bring your attention to, if you design, if you think about troubleshooting even um, networks in data center, that would be a different story than the ones you talk about in Canvas. Because in a data center um, and the Canvas, the traffic is spanning differently. North, south in Canvas, east, west in a data center. And that's why you find spine and leaf. Spine and leaf in data center is in terms of design is redundancy without loops, okay? And the reason we use spine and leaf in data center is because we would like to avoid, because of two reasons. Number one, we need to achieve redundancy. Number two, we need to avoid the case where you have to have loops and then we have loop prevention mechanism and that will create issues to you, right? So if you think of spine and leaf, it might look something like this, okay? Uh, so here, the, the you know, this is, the leaf means the top of the rack switches, traditionally speaking, uh, TOR, top of the rack switches, and the spine are the core or the aggregation slash distribution. We have leaves for storage, we have leaves for connectivity with other, you know, outside the data center and so on. Um, again, we are not talking about design or we're not really uh, uh, focused on design, but at least if, if I give you an idea and put this in perspective, then that would be something that you can envisage and understand. Um, you can scale up and beyond, up, up, meaning I can, in the spine and leaf stuff, I can have something like this, spine and super spine and so on. So think of this one like aggregation layer, kind of, right? And then um, super spine. Notice there are no loops, zero loops. Yet we have multiple links to multiple switches. Notice the spine, or let's say this stick, this area spine is basically uh, two switches. So from each leaf, I'm able to take two links. Notice the spine switches are not connected. So there are really no physical loops in here. No physical loops um, in this case. Now, of course, when you buy and support these switches, you need to know the warranty case, uh, you know, what kind of support contract you have with your customer and so on. Uh, according to these things, you start really um, you know, plan your uh, relationship. Um, these switches, the CX platform, when, when you physically have the switch, a physical switch, it comes, uh, you can install what's so called the, uh, an app. So the application that comes, so this physical switch itself has a USB stick. So you can insert, you will insert the USB stick into the switch. You communicate with that USB stick from your mobile device. You will download the app. That app can do the initial, uh, even more than initial configuration, switch name, stacking, some VLANs and multiple different things. You can basically, this is a, an example of an app, how it looks like on your smart device. So app is a unique feature that you can integrate. Even this app can also be integrated with NetEdit, the uh, managed platform. You can integrate the app with that NetEdit and be able to use that app to automate certain processes. Now, all in all, we're talking about the beauty of platform C Aruba CX versus the, you know, the traditional style of um, deploying stuff. Operating model here, CX portfolio end to end, and you would rather have the customer having one single port uh, line, a command line. And we're talking about the embedded analytics by nature, uh, natively, intelligent automation, seventh generation ASIC, which is how many billion instructions per second. Uh, the, 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 the infrastructure or the structure is non blocking because they use kind of a mesh communication, multi layer, which um, Basically, if a traffic comes from ingress, they can select the best path to destination. And there is, um, if say if destination one is busy, destination two is not busy, uh, the traffic will not be held because destination one is busy. So uh, that's why we have kind of a mesh communication inside. The, we have some uh, scheduler uh, who will look after um, which port to ingress and which port to egress and how to manage the traffic and so on. That's a very, very quick um, introduction on the What's the uh, platform portfolio of the Aruba uh, devices 
and then we looked at stacking kind of concept between different CX switches as well as compare this one to the non CX switches. Um, that will lead us to a lab number one. Oh, I have a question here. Okay, guys, continuing from where we started, let's just look at a few um, bits and pieces. Basically, we look at the command line and um, some other features, basically. So, again, remember, the behavior, i.e. Uh, the state of the interfaces, um, it is layer 2, layer 3, the capability to uh, change the interface mo uh, mode from root, i.e. layer 3 to layer 2, all of these are basically um, platform specific. So there are some generic obviously things. If there are some differences, you need to read the uh, technical documentation for that specific model, if you like, yeah? So um, every one of those switches should have a console interface, um, obviously, yeah? Um, normally console pool, um, traditionally we used to use serial interface to the console and then move to the RJ45 format. And then uh, a lot of vendors now, they go for the USB-C uh, console interface. So again, depends on platform, USB-C or RJ45. Uh, these two uh, are supported. Probably some platform, uh, some models within CX support both. Uh, some other models might support one of them only. That's the boot rate, uh, you know, the serial connection settings, basically, yeah. The way they would like the naming convention goes into the Aruba 6 uh, platform, member, slot, port. So the interface name would be, say, 1 slash 1 slash 1, 1 slash 2 slash 3, and so on. So that's the port, and then uh, the last thing is the port. If you look at an example here, if we take into account this is a fixed port switch, meaning the ports are not changeable, it is single member, member one. Now the slot, the first slot, that's the only one slot on that switch, and the port according to what port number here is port number 48, as per the example shown here. Another example can we can show, uh, member two, member ID two, the one on the right hand side, and then slot number three, the green, line or the green color and the amber color or the orange one is port 24 on that specific slot so it's really easy straightforward to understand okay so for prompts uh, we have operator prompt which is uh, greater than sign a lot of vendors they have similar to this manager uh, prompt config global config one interface config example and in this case, routing config, like, you know, OSPFCA. And in this case, another example is VLAN 100 config. Context sensitive help. If I issue the question mark, it will list all commands in that context. So in here, we are the manager mode. And we have a question mark here. It means it will list all commands for that specific mode, um, indeed. Um, if you have a command and you would like to find subcommands, like show access list, then question mark will show you the subcommands after the access list in this example. Um, if you type config, if you can, if you type the command unique combination of letters, that is that can or can, the switch or the platform can uniquely identify uh, what you intend to do, then it will accept the command as a full command. So conf like config there's no other command start with c o in f and that's why the switch was able to say oh he means config or she means config if you're using the tab you can use the tab so you if you'd like to auto complete then tab is very good way to do it i always advise people not to complete the command typing never do that because if you make a mistake continue typing you will not discover that mistake or typo if you would like to start with a unique combination and use the tab that will auto complete the command and this is the best way to go. If you have a command and you have double tab after the command, it will list in one line or if there are many uh, in one line, all sub commands underneath that. So interface, uh, in this case, interface, and we have the what commands are being supported 
underneath the interface context. To get that switch information, simply speaking, you have a lot of um, uh, you know a lot of information that you can get out. Um, the show command is one of the most commonly used command in any switch platform in any vendor, basically. So you would normally would like to have a baseline. So you would look at um, you know what is expected from the switch. Maybe you have configured the switch initially. You configure all the setup, and you'd like to have kind of a screen um, uh, snapshot, if you like. And this we call this checkpoint. But I'll come back to this. Um, and then this is kind of your baseline. After which, if any changes happen, any anomalies, the switch should understand the difference between the good and the bad, or the good and the any anomality, based on your configuration, obviously. Yeah. A command show version to show you the version of uh, the uh, operating system here. This is the version shown in here. Show system is a very good uh, command that shows you the MAC address, the serial number, as you can see here, um, we, and, and some other parameters, the part number or the product ID. This is the unique identification for each model within these switches. Um, Show running config. The show running config show you the current configuration on the switch. Um, the top CPU or top memory. Top CPU will show you the CPU list. Uh, top is a Linux command, and uh, you can see what uh, is consuming CPU and what is the percentage of that in terms of CPU time and memory. Um, show events like show log, basically. Minus R stands for reverse. So I'm uh, asking the switch to show me um, the logs in a reverse order. There are multiple different ways you can send the logs uh, to, an extent, to an extend the log server or syslog. But here we'd like to see the events or logs on the interface itself. Show interface brief is a command that will list every single interface regardless of the type. Meaning, if I have layer two interfaces, if I have layer three interfaces, this command will list all of them. Layer two interface, uh, physical port. Layer three interface can be anything like a switched virtual interface, which is basically a VLAN interface. Oh, it will show you the physical interface. So both. Okay. So that will list every single interface on the, on the switch, including obviously loopback interface and so on. Some basic configuration when you do and uh, when you try to configure any switch, you would normally go through these. You will assign a switch a host name. In this case, the host name uh, uh, value is access one. Um, you have to be in the config mode. Notice that in the previous slide here, you are in the config mode. So you have to be in the config mode and then you configure whatever configuration. Uh, default all ports disabled. Now, this is something correct based on the what platform, what model. Example in this case, if I take switch 6300, for example, then that is not true. Okay, if I take port um, switch model 8400 and 8300s, yeah, then this switch, uh, this command or this statement is correct. To enable interface in any way, you say no shutdown command. To disable the interface, you say shutdown command. Uh, to interface, describe it. Um, you just use a description as a keyword. Show interface one slash one slash one. You can see here in an example, the switch interface one slash one slash one has been shut down by admin, so administratively down. And the state of that interface is down. And this is the description of that interface down and that interface description. Another example, interface is up. This is due to the fact that we have issued the command no shut down on that interface. LLDP is very, very important. By default, LLDP is enabled on the switch interface as well as globally. Show LLDP neighbor info. You can see the list of neighbors and it's a layer to discovery. Layer to discovery, LLDP is a layer to discovery. Um, basically, this is to discover the neighbor. What information do I get? It depends on on the switch platform, but at a minimum, you'll get the name, the port ID, 
you will get the capabilities you get many things uh, but that's the you know kind of um, the minimum what you get uh, when you issue this command so it depends again on what platform you're talking about this is independent of platform so the cx can be connected to our os which is lldb is enabled by default on both they can understand cdp also they can communicate cdp if a device running cdp uh, for example icmp everyone knows about icmp is to verify connectivity at layer three so basically it's ip protocol number one and it's one of the things that when you use the bing command we use um, icmp uh, to validate reachability now it wouldn't tell you the details in between it don't we don't know icmp doesn't do that trace route on the other hand is the tool that will say I, I i'm jumping five hops to reach that destination i will give you the ip address of these hops if possible but icmp is simply speaking is a simple reachability test they will not tell you the infrastructure over which that command has traveled so when i bing i get um, um i issue an echo request echo means please answer me okay so i'm requesting you to echo what i'm trying to find out and i get an echo reply so here an example i'm being from the station to a certain destination station a to station b and i'm getting a response so station a is getting a response from station b trace route on the other hand is the mechanism to find the path through which we route traffic okay not necessarily route i mean reach the destination but trace route i.e trace the route to that destination tell me what's going on so knowing what they do obviously trace route is different than icmp which works kind of the other way around icmp will will send with ttl large number 255 for example or 64. Um, trace route will send with a minimal um, ttl time to live for the packet they will say start with one then when you hit the next hub it will be decremented that will be zero this will say uh, please send me another one with a with a larger TTL and with that they will send the information along uh, with that request so so the first hub will say okay listen send I uh, haven't been able to reach that destination can you please send me uh, um, a frame with TTL equals two so that will be able um, to send it out and then this guy will will fall short will say okay uh, the ttl is zero and yet we have not reached that destination so that would send back a message back to the source and say please send me uh, another packet with a ttl equal three so now i i glean the information from that um, you know being um, the ip address of the second top and then once they send that information this will decrement it by minus one that would be then two ttl equals two this will be decrementing it by minus one that would be ttl equals one it reaches the destination you get a response from here okay so that's what it is power over ethernet one of the key features nowadays in any really edge-based platform uh, infrastructure and uh, we have different power classes so according to what you're trying to achieve um, then we will enable PoE plus is definitely, definitely, um, that's the most commonly used PoE format, if you like, or standard, uh, which is 802.3 uh, AT. And then we have uh, PoE plus plus, and this is type 3 and type 4, type 3 being 60 watt max, and type 4 being 100 watts max. It depends on the platform what you're trying to achieve here. Okay, so we understand all of these concepts here and should be easy to grasp um, in this case. One of the things you will do, um, so you're gonna configure the host name, that's as a, at a minimum, and you will configure a bunch of other things as well. So you would, you would like to configure the management interface. So the switches come with a built-in management interface. Now, to understand how that works, simply speaking, they uh, the switches they have built in what's so called VRF. 
VRF is virtual routing and forwarding. Think of this one like a switch being virtualized inside the switch. Now the, the management interface is its own VRF by default. So you can say show interface MGMT, it will show you the list of configurations on that interface. And there's a default VRF where every other interface is a member of that default VRF. Right, so out of band management, if that switch, um, obviously CX switch has a physical out of band management and that's a layer three interface, internally that will be mapped to what's so called interface MGMT. That's for the out of band management. And the rest of the interfaces would be mapped to um, default VRF called default. Right, so we understand all of that, that's all nice and good. Um, to be able to, so to, to be able to communicate with the switch, you need SSH, for example, um, you need HTTPS, um, and then HTTPS service has to be enabled or have, um, has to be, um, either disabled or enabled, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Now, it depends also on, on what VRF you would want to, manage and configure the uh, the switch. Are you, would you like to do it on default VRF? Or would you like to do it on non-default VRF? Or would you like to do it on, um, you know, typically I would go for MGMT VRF and manage my switch or my switches based on that. Sometimes the infrastructure requires that you might not want to use MGMT, you might want to use something else. Maybe I'm, uh, I'm using MG, MGMT for um, stacking split brain, um, to, to, you know, so I cannot really use it for management, for example. Um, so it's possible sometimes not to want to use the MGMT interface. Um, some of the commands here we can see clearly. Um, when you connect to the switch, by default, it has a username admin and no password. So by default, the switch has a username admin. Password is nothing. So when you connect and you press enter, it will ask you what is the new password. You're going to enter the new password. Interfaces by default either shut down if there's uh, certain models like 8400, 8300, 6400. All these interfaces are shut down by default. Um, 6200, for example, 6300, these interfaces are not shut down by default. You will find out definitely. Um, so here, an example of assigning an IP to management interface, no shutdown. And please note the command is called IP static, not IP address. Default gateway, and then the name server, which is DNS, basically. So that's just an example of a command that can be issued to set up certain parameters. Um, SSH server VRF MGMT, meaning I'm enabling SSH server on the VRF interface called management interface, which is a typical uh, default management interface. By the way, this management VRF MGMT, you cannot delete, you cannot modify. The default VRF, you cannot delete, but you can modify in a sense that you can move the interfaces out of that to a different VRF. But the out-of-band management interface, it's no way to be moved out from the VRF MGMT. You can't do that. Okay. HTTPS uh, server uh, VRF MGMT. So now, basically... Sorry, Navid. Sorry, can I ask you a question? Why, yeah. would, we, why would we enable SSH? So the slide behind. Okay. So, so HTTP server, uh -huh. I, I know, so you can oh, right. see through a browser. Fair enough. So if you like to, for two reasons at least, I would say. Reason number one, if you wanted to remotely connect to SSH, uh, to the switch using SSH, then you have to have SSH enabled, correct? That's number one. So that's if you're sort of using a third party application like a secure CRT. Yeah, if you like to remotely connect to that switch using SSH, then there we go. Yeah. Okay, so we have to enable SSH server here exactly. so we can send SSH through exactly. the secure yeah. security. Okay. okay. Just to keep you also in perspective, according to in, the, in this context, Telnet is not supported. So these switches do not support non secure connected, uh, connectivity. Telnet is not supported. Yeah. That's one reason. The other reason. If you need to manage these switches in NetEdit, which is the REST API platform for management for these switches, 
SS hit is a must have for because what NetEdit does, they will go back and say, okay, I'm going to verify these commands before I execute, I accept the command to be pushed to the switch. So they will use SSH to kind of command line interface to the switch and verify the commands on the switch. So SSH is a must be enabled feature for NetEdit to work. Yeah. Question. Can yeah. we enable SSH server on the default VRF as well? 100%. So it can, it can be enabled on multiple VRFs. Exactly. 100%. All right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You choose, you decide. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, HTTPS, again, the same context here. We are not, uh, these switches do not support anything other than secure communication. Uh, that includes Telnet is not supported. HTTP is not supported. TCP port 80 is not supported. Telnet is not supported. Perfect. Um, one last thing or one more thing uh, is the REST API. So if you need to communicate any REST API to the switch, so that includes, uh, you know, the, the well-known NetEdit platform, or if you have created um, some sort of a code that communicates REST API or testing REST API uh, communication, that feature has to be enabled. If you only wanted to read information, so I'd like to get the get method from REST API application, you only need to have the access mode as read only. If you need to make changes, like you write things, put, update, delete, and all that stuff, then the uh, REST API mode should be read and write in this case. Yeah? Okay. There is a very important concept here, which is about the configuration file. And that is a concept that some vendors, they have used it, like Juniper. We know Juniper, they have been using it for years. Uh, Arista, they have something similar to that. Cisco, they don't have. So Checkpoint, if you think of uh, Checkpoint is the kind of a snapshot, if you like, of the configuration with its metadata. So in that Checkpoint, I'm able to store uh, the state of the configuration into a Checkpoint file, right? You also, I would like you to think of a Checkpoint like documentation, probably, yeah? So if I need to go back like 20 checkpoints back and that checkpoint was, you know, my baseline, if you like, the switch had issues and I want to go back one step back or two steps or two uh, checkpoints back, then I can do this. So really, really great feature. So you can always uh, roll back to other checkpoints. You can upload checkpoint from, uh, you know, to the running configuration and it will be on the fly update. It will replace the current config completely, right? So it is one of the key features here uh, to copy, to be able to copy, you know, checkpoint to the running configuration. And it is uh, something really, really important. Um, by default, there are no checkpoints initially that on the switch. Yeah, go ahead, sir. So I was just going to ask the checkpoints, can they be uh, uploaded from the switch to a remote location? Uh, yeah, you can copy so that one to, yes, yes. You okay. can back it up, exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's very flexible. So by default, there's no checkpoints initially. So you can kind of, uh, uh, you know, get your reference or datum if you like. So I created a checkpoint. Um, I, I, this is just a name, you call it a name zero, whatever. Now you copy checkpoint zero to start up. We can copy checkpoint to TFTP, whatever, um, to an external uh, server as well. Show, uh, show checkpoint also a command that will show you the checkpoint. Now, how checkpoints get created? Two ways. Uh, by automatic process, by you know, nat naturally will hap what happens, I, I changed something, I created some config, and then I left the switch, went for a break to whatever, by default, after five minutes of inactivity from the last change that was made on the switch, a checkpoint will be generated by default. But this is the default behavior. Um, I can change that. Or you can manually create a checkpoint at your convenience. Uh -huh. Now, creating a checkpoint does not mean the running config is saved into startup config. Not at all. So creating a checkpoint is... The running config and its metadata is stored in that checkpoint. Okay. Um, is it possible to roll back? There's something called auto roll back. Okay. 
What does this mean? Let us say, for example, I'll give you a scenario. Uh, I might be connected remotely to a switch. I'm configuring the switch. Then um, I would like to have kind of a, a safety net for myself. If I messed up configuration, if I by mistake um, shut down the port where I remotely connect to, I will lose connectivity to that interface or to that switch completely. In this case, what happens if I enable the road, uh, the auto rollback, so checkpoint auto five, it means in five minutes, you will be presenting me. So normally it will be uh, two minutes before the end. Yeah, within two minutes in here. It will say, okay, um, are you happy to confirm the configuration you are doing now? Now imagine you are remotely connecting and connected to that um, you know, platform or switch and you're typing commands and making changes and suddenly you shut down the pool, you lost connectivity. So there we go now, that message comes up on the interface which you don't see because you lost that communication. The switch now says, oh, I have not got any response from the user. It means the user is not happy to go ahead and apply the configuration they have made from last checkpoint created. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to be a good man. So the switch says, okay, they say, okay, this guy is not responding. I will take him back, I roll back to the last known checkpoint the switch was running. Okay, that's what it means. Think of this one kind of a, a safety net for you that if you miss the app somehow, you probably don't know at some stage what you're doing, then a checkpoint, a roadback, auto roadback is uh, something um, uh, as a great tool uh, in this case, yeah. Um, so some f uh, some features at layer two. Um, so we talk about VLAN. Now by default we have single VLAN on these switches, which is VLAN number one uh, by default. Now that also depends on the platform. If a platform or not a platform, a model within that um, CX platform, some of them might have all interfaces, members of VLAN 1, example 6200 switches, 6300 switches. These are layer 2 interfaces natively speaking. Um, another example of say 8400 switches, all interfaces are natively layer 3 interfaces. So. The VLAN one exists, but there are no members on that VLAN, so no interface members for that VLAN. So it depends again on what uh, platform you have. Uh, the VLANs can be different things. Uh, again, um, the VLAN can be created uh, based on the requirements to segment the network and to improve security, obviously, efficiency, broadcast domain as a VLAN. VLAN creation is extremely straightforward. And when you create a VLAN, it is the VLAN, it's a layer two feature. The VLAN by itself is a virtual entity, then you map multiple physical interfaces inside that VLAN. When you assign an IP address to a VLAN, we call this one switch virtual interface, SVI. This means in a way indirectly, the interfaces that are members of those or this VLAN will kind of inherit I wouldn't say inherit directly, but um, if you have machines connected to these interfaces in that VLAN, then they are in that subnet, basically. Uh, ports can be either access interface or it can be a trunk interface. The way we configure this one, to be able to do this, you have to have a layer two interface member of the VLAN, and then we can uh, specify access member of the VLAN. If it is access of a VLAN, then untagged, obviously. Uh, if it is a trunk port, so you can only be um, an access member of a single VLAN. If that port is a trunk port, then we're going to say uh, trunk port. Um, but you also uh, can specify the native VLAN. If you do not specify native VLAN, uh, it will be VLAN 1 by default, meaning all other VLANs would be trunk meaning tagged, and the only VLAN that would be untagged in this case is a native VLAN. And if you leave things as default, the native VLAN would be VLAN number one. Um, you can create link aggregation, we call it LAG, L-A-G, LAG, link aggregation. 
and uh, you could either use static link aggregation or dynamic link aggregation recommendation is dynamic link aggregation um, we do support static i.e no protocols or dynamic link aggregation now if you connect multiple diff so th that's the recommended way because that would check the integrity of the neighbor or the peer and make sure that link aggregation will only bring up the interface only if the other side is aggregated as well and they exchange the system id making sure uh, it's correctly configured uh, that's why we recommend it um, to to be the way to the, for uh, link aggregation you can interconnect between different vendors for link aggregation so you can have one side as juniper switch another side as aruba switch then you can do link aggregation you can do static obviously because they don't care about the other end i form local link aggregation on the interfaces um or you can you can go dynamic lacp which is the recommended way of doing it the maximum number of interface of link aggregation is eight ports and you have you can have up to 256 lags it can be layer two layer three obviously um, in the link aggregation we um, the way because that's a technology standard actually standard um, there's no inherited load balance uh, when i say load balance there's no one-to-one -one, like 50 50 percent on each interface they will do load sharing based on certain hashing mechanism and the hash mechanism is either based on layer 3 or layer 2 or layer 4 so if this based on layer 2 then it's destination source mac layer 3 the default behavior or application port tcp udp port and so on so uh, it's quite possible to do that now once you do the link aggregation it's really f flexible in a sense nearly i would say all links would be used the more traffic you send uh, the more probability the higher probability that both of these links will be used equally nearly uh, for the configuration straightforward simply speaking uh, enable lag disable here default and then uh, to do this you create a lag it's a number just any number 100 or 200 whatever uh, so kind of a virtual interface if you should recommend your interface brief you'd see the lag listed at the very bottom of the list as, as an interface. You might want to say no shot, no routing, uh, LACP mode active. One side has to be active. The other side can be active or passive. I'm talking about LACP. So if you decided to go ahead and use LACP for link aggregation, then one side would be at a minimum, one side should be active and the other side can be passive. And then to add the interfaces to a link aggregation, it's also straightforward. You could go one slash one slash one, one slash one slash two, and then you can say in one command, one line, and then you press carriage return, and you're gonna say no shut down or whatever, and then you map it to the link aggregation. So you can have um, a span of um, interfaces. Um, another very important protocol we need to talk about is spanning tree. Now, spanning so, tree. Sorry, now if you can go back there on the LACP active passive. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mean this one? So if we create the link between the two switches, <clears throat> uh -huh. so what what role would the active and passive will play? It's if I keep one side LACP mode active, and the other side LACP mode. The only passive. difference is the the who initiate the communication. That's it. Okay, so if I keep both of them. Active, active, it doesn't they really matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't and then, matter <clears throat> so if I have a LACP, so if there's an IP address involved, so it doesn't have to be made trunk then, is it? So it, it's up to you. So you can have, you have two options. Option number one, you can make it the LACP, i.e. the lag interface as a layer three interface by issuing the command routing in that interface. Hmm. Then you can assign physical um, um, a specific IP on that logical uh, lag, uh, say on the lag, yes. Yeah. Or you can make it layer two, map it to the VLANs, and the native mm. VLAN normally usually will be the one that will be assigned an IP address, and that will be communicated with L, uh, you know, uh, LLDP, for example. So you have two okay. options. Yeah. So layer two, then you'd probably have to go no no routing, and then enable as a exactly. call for allowed whatever VLANs you want to allow. Perfect. Now another question I want to ask you is yeah? the when you create these legs mm -hmm. and there is a 
term called multi chassis. That's different. Multi yeah, I see what you mean. We call it in, in this context, we call it multi, uh, multi uh, VSX lag. So the multi chassis lag, when you have a dual control plane, dual control plane stacking, so VSX, for example. Cisco, they call it VS, uh, VSS or something, or VPC or something. Um, so the multi-lag, the concept is very simple. So where do you configure that? That's your question probably, yeah? So I'm sorry I interrupted you. What was your question? Yeah, that's the question because now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the middle of doing this now, we have um, VSF stack is going to be um, LECP to the two different chassis, two switches, 8320. Can I ask the question? Uh, I, I would need to ask you this question. What is the platform you have? What platform? What's the 6300 model? 6300 on the okay, uh, XS side and 8320 on the 8320 here. Okay, now tell me, this is going to be stacked or this is going to, or both are going to be stacked? Six, 6320s are, are stacked. Uh, as I expected. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so it's a stack. Perfect, no problem. So look, 8320 is a single switch, correct? 63... No, they're, they're, they're VSX, VSX. Stack as well, you say, yeah? They're VSX, yeah. Okay, okay, no problem. And these two, VSF? Yeah. Oh, no, okay. Yes. And these are VSX, correct? VSX, yes. No problem at all. So from these two switches, these are single control plane stacking. You happy mm. with that? Yeah. Meaning they represent like as if they are single entity? Mm. From these two perspective, there are dual control plane stacking, and this is where you do the multi chassis lag, okay, mm -hmm. LACP, right? Okay, we call it in. So they won't, initially they start calling it MC, but then they changed this one to VSX to distinguish that sort. But it's the same, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so basically the multi lag or the multi uh, chassis lag is done on the eighty three hundred switches. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're going to say, okay, these two connections connect, say, this way or whatever, right? Yeah. So these, you're going to go then um, link aggregation. From the 6300 perspective, it is mm. a single link. It yeah. doesn't care what about the other end, right? Yeah. So we're going to do normal business lag on the 6300. Mm. And on the VSX end, you will configure the VSX LACP or multi uh, chassis lag okay um so the multi chassis lag simply speaking if i'd like to simplify it this way um from the dual controlled plane stacking you will configure the multi lag or multi chassis lag on them so you are telling them this and you are forming lacp but the fact you are dual control plane i have to configure multi lag uh, the multi chassis lag the thing is, when I created the lag on the 8320 side, this I side, didn't mention yeah. anywhere is a multi-chassis lag, but when I see show lag, it shows me it's multi-chassis. So, okay, fair enough, no problem. So what, it depends on the version of, of the, it is multi-chassis, the fact, because these are two separate control planes to, um, stack. Mm -hmm. And it cannot be single chassis, because they are multiple, they are two. So basically, because I created in the two separate ones, it's just automatically configured out on multi chassis. Oh, yeah, lag. there are certain steps to, if you have done, already done it, then yes, you will have had followed the steps to configure. You will do it on each individual switch, uh, correct? Mm. Yes. Exactly. And on the, on the other end, which is 63 VSF, you will have done it once only because. On, on that's one, the single that's one, single link, yes, well, exactly. yes, single yeah, out with, exactly. with the two ports in a lag. Yes, yes, and then a separate lag on one distribution and a separate lag on the other distribution. Makes sense, absolutely, hundred percent. So basically, you will have configured on switch number one, and then you have configured switch number two. You yeah. will have defined defined what interface, what yeah. interface, and then you have configured that. So the steps you have followed, uh, there are steps on one and the other steps. You repeat kind of the same steps mm. and then change the because. Uh, the interface is different, isn't it? Right on this one than this one. Yeah, that's the multi lag basically. So, so, so mm. the question here is: uh, in nowhere on the eighty three twenties, I specified that is is going to be a multi chassis lag. So, did the system figure out itself is a multi chassis lag because oh, yeah, they are in the, because oh, yeah, they are yeah, VSX yeah. peers? Of course, they are not because they are dual control plane stack, and it knows it's a multi chassis lag. That's the that's the way they look at it. Okay. Okay. But from the outside world perspective, they are single 
single uh, switch from the LACB perspective. So yeah. I'm looking from the 6300 perspective, I see them as a single switch. Internally, they will see each other, they will do LACB, but they know they are multi chassis leg. Okay. Internally, but that should not at all impact anyone else outside. You know? Meaning, switch number three is not aware of that at all. It doesn't care and doesn't have to know at all. This, you mean the stack? The, the stack, stack. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, yeah single now, multi. how would I test the that that the lag is working? Uh, you mean the multi chassis or the normal lag? Multi chassis lag. So will I just? Probably go switch off the one interface on one of the distribution and it's, see. Yeah, you do, yeah, of course. We have so you have scenarios. Scenario number one when the link goes down. Yeah. Mm. So if you bring this link down and mm. you say you issue a Bing, say whatever, mm. yeah, to mm. a destination. And obviously, the destination has to be reachable, meaning okay. if the destination was connected here somehow or going to um, somewhere in the infrastructure. Mm. It has to be reachable whether the link is up, one link up, or both link one of them down. By shutting down one leg link, yeah, one physical yeah, leg. Yeah, so you down yeah. one of them and then yeah. double check if that is still reachable or not. Huh. Obviously, another, another, you wouldn't do this, obviously. You kill one switch, like, you know, reboot the switch. Obviously, that's, another... that's sort of something I'm trying to because that's something. <laughs> Oh, because that's the whole purpose of this, because they wanted to bring exactly redundancy so, in this yeah. stack. Uh -huh, if the uh -huh, one, um, one of the stack goes down completely, and then yeah. see if every single functionality, obviously, one of which will be LACP, maybe other mm -hmm. like routing and uh, you know, whatever other functionalities also should be tested. If you bring one down, the if your design is correct, so you have two things design and configuration, mm -hmm. configuration correct and your design is correct connectivity physical connectivities reachabilities then if you have taken care of all of these uh, aspects then that will have um, succeeded the test basically yeah yes probably no yes uh, because the, the vsf stack has like a mirror copy of servers that are attached to it uh -huh. so if i bring one down so there's another copy of servers running on the other ports yes so this is something i want to test I want to bring the power down like, to, you know, to one of these switches, yeah. You can, yeah. I mean, if, again, as I said, if you deploy it correctly, then you can bring one of the stack down on the mm. VSF, as well as you can bring one of the VSX stack down and see your resiliency of your network. And how far can you go with redundancy? No, yeah, VS, VSX stack <laughs> is in production, though I can't play you with can't that. You can't do that, no. no this I'm saying, probably yeah. bring the link down. Maybe. Link, yeah, yeah, bring the link down. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to <laughs> test that. Oh, jeez, yeah, yeah, be fired next day. <laughs> <laughs> Come to us. <laughs> okay, um, hopefully I did answer your question. Yeah. Now that you did, thanks very much. Yeah. Oh, no problem. I yeah. won't hold up anymore. I'll yeah, that's fine. You, no, you can ask as many questions. Right, um, as we say, you know, to add the... Uh, the lag uh, port the lag then that's very simple yeah i think we t we started or we wanted to start on spanish tree now spanish tree is as old or older than me uh, probably uh, <laughs> no of course not um spanish tree has been around for years now uh, things have evolved um of course i will not go through the history of spanish tree at all this is not meant to be but i would like to look at the behavior of spanish tree from the cx perspective now for CX, the span tree by default, it can be enabled or it might be disabled. Again, it depends on the model. Okay, for example, 8400 span tree is disabled, 6100 span tree is enabled by default. So again, it depends on the model. Again, that's not our topic. We need to look at what is the default behavior of span tree. By default, the span tree version is uh, multiple span tree, MSTP. Now, MSTP means that we will have instances and we will have region. So the, you know, the span tree by default, if it is not enabled, it has no region basically. And, um, or if you like to have a talk about, you know, the region name would be the MAC address of the switch and uh, they will behave. If you never span tree, they will behave like RSTP behavior. To uh, just put you in perspective, span tree started as STP moved into RSTP and the latest one from 2005, nearly more than 17 years now, is basically MSTP integrated in the dot one q standard. Now, when you talk about span tree, we talk about the ports. So in the, um, 
MSTP, uh, we're talking about, or even stuff from RSTP, the ports have changed from being, um, uh, what to call, uh, you know, we have designated ports, alternate ports, rather than being blocking, or the state is discarding. Uh, it used to be called blocking. Now, the way span tree works now is nearly, um, I wouldn't say very different, uh, because they in incorporated some extra features like handshake capability rather than using the timers. They do still have the timers, you know, forward delay maximum age timers, the 15 and 20 seconds stuff, but uh, they don't use the timers in span tree, uh, you know, more than modern span tree. They use handshake process. Um, and there are ways to speed up. You might want to say, okay, the edge port is edge port admin. So in this case, the the second connection starts on that interface it will bring up the interface immediately the very old or the original standard they used to take 50 seconds to bring up that interface and in modern networks these are not good so the interface can be either designated which is the one every single port on the root switch is designated root port is the best path to that uh, switch the shortest or the the least costly one alternate is blocking and backup is the you know second uh, you know worst if you like, in a sense that if you have um, spanning tree if you have a tree, um, you know connection between devices, the the one on the root would always be designated interfaces, and um, and the one closest to the closest from uh, from the cost perspective because they will take the bandwidth into account be the root port it might not be directly connected so if the interface speeds are different then it might be indirectly connected and that can be the root port indirectly connected to spanning tree um, and then um, uh, the third one would be alternate so alternate would be the one that will be discarding meaning it will drop uh, traffic uh, if it is it receives the traffic remember how switches work in, in the efficiency of switches is based on the MAC table. With the spanning tree, the MAC table will take off, meaning there will not be a path in the MAC table because MAC is learned from the source, isn't it, right? So I receive um, uh, a traffic request and then being sent out on the interfaces. When I read the source MAC address coming ingress, then I will populate the MAC table. Um, the port that is discarding, it will not really, um, you know, process any uh, frame. In that case, the uh, the MAC table on the switch will not include the discarding interface, and that makes sense, right? Um, if you need to configure span tree correctly on the switch interfaces, you will need uh, obviously to go through the steps. You will have to have few parameters to configure. Um, config name, okay. Uh, you need to have provision and then instance to VLAN mapping. Now, the VLAN doesn't have to exist, but instance will exist in every. Um, so, say we have five switches in, in a region or four switches, whatever. Then you will configure these parameters, not necessarily the VLANs that map to instance. So, but you will configure the instance, the revision number, the area, uh, the config name, and so on on each individual um, one of these switches. Um, again, multiple things, of course, the security, the enhancements, port, uh, uh, root guard, um, filter, spanning tree. These features I will not cover here, but at least um, you need to be aware of the fact that these switches are able to support multiple different features uh, as other platforms um, uh, as well. One of the things uh, we can do admin edge and admin network this is kind of say, okay, don't really wait. You immediately move to uh, forwarding mode. And for the admin edge is you expect uh, to receive no uh, PPDU, no hellos from Spanish tree, because this is supposed to be connected to an end device. Admin network is the uplinks between the switches. These are the ones that you would say, okay, I'm gonna just, you would expect to receive PPDU. Um, on the on these interfaces so you kind of speeding up rather than waiting one or two seconds you will wait zero seconds basically to converge um, one of the things that you can configure is PBDU guard and this sorry, means not sorry can, I, can we go back to admin edge and admin network yeah 
So what I understand is um, admin edge HTTP type you can you configure on the ports which are connected to direct direct end endpoints. Inputs, and yeah, devices, laptops, and devices, stuff, yeah. yeah, laptop stuff. Yeah. And admin network would be the uplink between ports. the switches. Yes, on trunk ports. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Normally, what happens? The, so the way explanatory works, there's something called handshake. So yeah. we kind of agree, and that process takes between two to six seconds. And if you would like to speed up that process, then you say, okay, the port you know yourself immediately. You go forwarding. For the admin edge, you are not expecting any PPDU. For the admin network, you, if you see any PPDU, you, you're good. You can process it, right? Yeah. But both, in both cases, we go uh, forwarding without waiting any, any seconds, basically. So the concept here is to speed up the process. Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> so I lost you. Are you talking? Mm -hmm. uh, I can't hear. Guys, can you hear me? So make sure that I'm heard. Hello? Uh, so yes, we can hear you. Okay. We can hear you. Yep. Yeah, so he, he, okay. So I'll move on till he comes back. Probably he, he, I think we lost him. No, I see him, but he can't talk. Shiv, are you there? Okay, so we'll move on from here. Okay, then if we need to get back, we get back. Yep. Um, so PPDU guards, simply speaking, if you receive uh, any PPDU, meaning traffic hellos uh, for Spanitary on the edge port, I will block it. Uh, PPDU filter is I ignore any Spanitary traffic received on that interface. So you might have maybe, let us say, uh, two buildings, and I don't want to process Spanitary traffic being received from one region to another region. So I ignore these packets and drop them basically, and I will not process them. So it's it's in effect it is the the opposite of PBDU guard. So, but in both cases I protect myself anyway. Yeah, but uh, the function of PBDU filter is just ignore and drop these packets. Yeah. Uh, one last thing I would like to mention just quickly: RPVST plus is supported on these devices. So if you inter Actually, it is, but we say our PPST, but it is a plus. The plus is because we rerun dot one Q, isn't it? Right? We're not running ISL. Okay. Um, just last thing, uh, RPVST plus is supported um, on these switches. So if you interface with Juniper or Cisco or any other vendor that runs RPVST, then we are able to communicate. You can change the mode from MSTP to RPVST. Any question here? So we looked at basic configs, basic setup provisioning that you needed anyway. We looked at things like link aggregation. The VRF is independent, but when I looked at that, I looked at VRF. Uh, it is something I wanted you to do to just to experience it. And uh, probably uh, then explanatory. Uh, so this uh, three features, if you like, in a way, and the previous module. Uh, I think I'm aware of the fact that most of you might have not yet finished the lab too. But um, as I said, uh, we, if you just move on from here, then we, you can always start where you left off. OSPF, again, this is not a topic about uh, detailed OSPF, but OSPF is a routing protocol, of course, you know this. And if you classify OSPF, it's a link state routing protocol, link state, which is basically work, which works to uh, take into account the state of the link and uh, building a database, topology database. Um, and it is the most commonly used protocol uh, version in uh, enterprise environments. So uh, that's link state uh, routing protocol. Um, OSPF relies on uh, areas, so to be able to communicate and uh, you need to establish a peering relationship, i.e. neighborhood. And for that to work, you have to make sure that the time, so the hello timers, the dead intervals or the dead timers are identical. If any authentication has been implemented, must be the same, identical on all of these switches who will form peer relationship. The area type. Uh, they will have to be the same area and the same area type. So 
when you configure area on certain uh, one of them, uh, that will be have to be the same on the other one. Um, so we said um, timers, uh, area type, authentication if need be. Um, these are the main things that you need to make sure that they are identical between uh, different switches. Right. Now, what happens really each time any switch slash multi-layer switch slash router runs OSPF, they will be uh, picking up what's so-called router ID. A router ID can be automatically assigned. It will be picked up automatically if you have not manually configured based on the highest loop back IP address. If not, then if no loop back, I mean um, being configured, it will look at the highest IP address, whether that is a VLAN, i.e. highest value. Uh, whether that is a VLAN interface or a physical port interface. OSPF runs as a layer 3. It can run on a VLAN, obviously. It can run if the interface is the layer 3, then it runs on that interface specifically. It's part of the standard. Um, it's um, RFC standards, or uh, IETF, basically. And it runs on IP protocol 89. Now, it's difficult to say if this is... Um, it depends how you look at it, or connection-oriented or connection-less. Because we are not using TCP, for example, um, we are not at, at layer four, we are layer three, kind of. Um, so we don't really normally classify kind of connection-oriented routing and connection list, except in the case for BGP, which is outside the scope here. Uh, as I said to you, a router ID is manually configured or highest loopback interface and a non-loopback highest IP interface. As best practice, create a loopback, that's number one. Give it an IP address according to a standard you create yourself. So you might say, okay, the first octet indicates, I don't know, the country. Second octet indicates the city. Third octet indicates the site. Then the fourth octet indicates, and then you have multiple digits, uh, three digits, maybe building, floor, cabinet. So you you create a standard. There's no such a standard in, in, in naming in uh, Roto ID convention, but you create your own standard, basically, yeah? So the switches will build uh, uh, adjacency relationship. The key point or the ultimate entity that will be consulted for routing is the routing protocol, the routing table. Okay. So the control plane, uh, remember tables are control, isn't it? And the, the routing table is a result of running a, a certain application like OSPF. So we will build the eventually a routing table and that's also called forward information base. Um, any entry in the routing table, it will be the ultimate uh, deciding factor if you like to route traffic. In a routing table can be, uh, there might be something like directly connected interfaces, static routes, dynamic routing like OSPF, uh, other dynamic routes for other destinations like um, uh, ISIS, but we don't support that here. Uh, REB, for example, BGP, all of these things are part of the routing uh, table. Um, and, and, and OSPF is a routing protocol that uh, has an admin distance of 110. Perfect. So they will start with the exchange of hellos uh, between themselves. So they're going to say, hey, that's my area. Um, they will send link, uh, send link state uh, advertisements. Like we call them LSAs. And there are multiple types of LSAs, one, two, three, four, five, seven, um, there's nine uh, opaque, uh, depends on version, like uh, version three runs also, another, other ones like 11. Um, so each one of these have a meaning, each one of them, these has a meaning. Uh, intra area, inside the area, um, this is summary, and this is root to ASE. Uh, uh, autonomous system border router, right? Um, this is uh, external routes. So, so these these two are external, basically. So this is if you convert, if you import or redistribute uh, from outside, uh, then that's um, type five. Um, type seven is uh, the same external, but exists in not so stubby area. Okay. Again, I'm not going to discuss so many of these things because they are we are limited in time, but uh, probably I'll touch on that quickly as we move forward in this um, OSPF. And then each one of those will build uh, a knowledge 
of the neighbors plus what the neighbors advertise so they will add themselves or the neighbors into the uh, topology eventually they will all have the same topology database um, so they will all have the same view to a network in that you know in, the, in that relationship in, in that area um, and, but the, which interface to select to uh, send the traffic out is relative to its location in that network but every one of them has identical copy of topological database. They all have the same copy and the same view of the topological database. So eventually, <clears throat> these routing protocols will run algorithm, shortest path first algorithm. Example here, we might have, remember, this is sophisticated routing protocol and it does take into account the bandwidth of the interfaces connecting uh, to different destinations. So we might have a core one here. It will know that we to reach this network, I can reach it from here as well as from here. From here will cost X, say it will cost 1000, right? And from here, it might cost 1000 plus the cost here, maybe 500. So they will accumulate the cost, they will add them together and they will figure out which one is the best to go to that destination. In case of equal cost, they will apply what's so called equal cost multipath up to eight links, uh, but it depends, that's theoretical, but it depends on the hardware. Some hardware support two links, some platforms support four, others might support eight. So if I have equal cost, then I will use these links um, in, a, in a load balanced manner. So 50-50, I will send, as per session, I will send traffic equally across the links between the switches okay so this they are able to support load, uh, link uh, um, uh, load balancing between over the links they also aware of the link aggregation they will consider link aggregation has a different speed or different priority but different speed normally so they will uh, prefer if there's a link aggregated or links aggregated and non-aggregated links they will always prefer the aggregated links before over the non-aggregated links. So that kind of stuff here. And if you think about the neighborhood, so if I say show OSPF, uh, IP, uh, IPS OSPF neighbors details, it tells you the neighbors. So it might have one neighbor or multiple neighbors, right? Uh, depends, so they will negotiate. And uh, if you are in a multi, uh, multi-axis area, which is ethernet, they will elect someone to become a DR. So remember the, the terms, just to make sure you're not confused. Router ID, every single OSPF device will have a router ID. And there are other terms, we use DR and BDR. And the concept of these terms, or the concept of this, is we will create kind of a tree to make it easy to communicate and to reduce the requirement for full mesh relationship. So if this router is a, an RD, a DR, then other routers in the network will, uh, and then one, the other one will become D BDR. So other routers in the network will communicate with this with a full relationship. Any update, uh, any update in the network, they will be sent to DR and BDR. The relationship um, between, they call these uh, DR other. It means they are not DR uh, or BDR. What happens if I need to send traffic, say there's a, there's a resource here, I need to send traffic, and that needs to go, say, to this uh, destination. They can, they will uh, choose the best path, independent whether DR or BDR. The location of DR and BDR has nothing to do with the traffic forwarding. It has to do with the updates between the switches. So the updates will be sent and received from DR and BDR. They will be sent using a multicast IP address 224005 and uh, 006 and received on 224005. So this is how uh, the routing uh, OSPF works basically, right? Um, obviously there are a lot of details in here, but at least at this uh, at this stage or at this level, you need to understand these basic um, uh, stuff. Um, now in case it depends. So when two routers are connected or switches are connected, um, they have or they will have to have the knowledge of the network link uh, type. 
So the interface type can be P2P, one-to-one, uh, i.e. point-to-point. It can be broadcast, which is the LAN normally, our LAN, uh, because that we have VLANs, then that would be seen as broadcast. And to configure that, simply speaking, IP or SPF, broadcast or point-to-point. -point. And just to uh, confirm what I've said to you, one of them would be elected as uh, DR, and the other one would be elected as a BDR. And the reason for this is to reduce these, um, to, to make it scalable, number one, um, by reducing the uh, the full mesh requirement um, in the case of uh, not having DR, BDR. Notice that in the case of point-to-point -point interface, such a requirement does not exist because there's no need for it, um, basically, because, um, simply speaking, um, it's just point-to-point. -point. They are not multi-axis, it's single axis, and it is directly connected, or at least seem to be directly connected. Even though the fact that, you, you know, the case VLAN, you might have directly connected interfaces, still that is that will elect DR and BDR because this is seen as Ethernet and it is seen as multi-axis. Uh, again, um, when you need to update the DR, you will update this one using uh, 22406. When you receive any update from DR, BDR, BDR will not update you, but DR will update you. BDR will receive updates from you and uh, will only kick in if DR goes down. That BDR will be uh, elevated, if you like, to DR and some other switch in the network will be promoted to uh, BDR. The election here uh, depends on the priority and um, in here you can see if the priority by default is 1, the highest router ID will, uh, will be elected as DR, the next highest will be BDR. Right, um, if you set the priority as 0, it means there's no way that this will participate in DR slash BDR election. Um, you, you will do this by having the interface and priority. Remember, DR, BDR business is happening between the switches on the interfaces. So one, one end will be DR, another end will be BDR. If there are scalability issues, and if we exceed the number of networks or devices in the network, it's a good idea to break the, uh, the network to multiple areas. Maybe this is because of scalability. So one of the uh, objectives in here too uh, for, is scalability. So I can increase the number of devices without impacting the performance of our network. Number two, maybe security, policy application to different areas and so on. So maybe you have branches, each branch or each bunch of branches might be in one area. So you control the traffic based on different areas. When you create an area, you are generating different definitions now. A new definition has come up now. It's called Area Border Router, ABR. All others are called internal routers. Areas can be different types. Transit, which is area zero, must exist. The number or the value of the area or the digit here, it's just a number. It looks like a 32 bit, so you might, normally you're gonna see area 0, .0, .0, .0, .0. Every one you're gonna see it as area 001. That's the area value. It looks like um, an IP address, but it's not really. Okay. Um, as we said, link state at uh, you know advertisement number one uh, and two, they are inside the area, and the rest are outside. Um, the multiple types of different areas. Stubby means I don't accept any external routes except the summary, and LSA one, LSA type two. If you'd say total stubby, it means no summary, only default route will be inside the area, unlike this, uh, the stubby where you can have summary plus default routes. Okay. Um, not so stubby is, uh, is in between. If there's a local connection, maybe to a local resource like internet, then we will accept external routes, but we will convert them as type seven. Type 7 only exists in not so stubby area, but not nowhere else at all, right? Area, um, an, an interface can be passive interface. Passive interface means that that interface will uh, will update, i.e. will advertise itself. Say an interface connected to an endpoint, that interface is going to advertise itself, but it will not 
um, uh, will not send out any hellos or updates on that interface because that interface is, is something connected to an endpoint or there's no really OSPF on the other side of the equation. Um, to go ahead and just configure the uh, OSPF, we will go root OSPF. You must uh, provide a process ID here, which because these switches can support multiple processes on that same switch. Normally, we'll, we'll produce multiple processes, and if there are multiple VRFs, we'll map a process to a VRF, maybe two or three of them. It depends. Rotor ID as a configuration, as I said to you, we're going to do that. The area, OSPF, IP OSPF area, and then you define if you look at the interface. If that is, you don't have, this is optional, obviously. The default goes to broadcast here. And if need be also optional, you can go for IP OSPF cost XYZ here. That should take us to lab number four. Uh, with that lab, lab number four, it means that we have finished up to four. So we'll talk about net edits in the context of the CX switches, but probably it might be worth looking to quickly look into what network management options do we have. We have mainly speaking three um, options. Option one, on-prem management. This can be on-prem. Uh, this can be either virtual appliance or you can buy as a physical, physical hardware. A wave is a multi-vendor management platform. Uh, the other option can be uh, central on-prem. So central as the cloud-based management. Also, uh, we can have that one as an on-prem. So that's another option. Third option is central, which is the cloud-based management. Uh, for central, they can only manage uh, Aruba devices. Like all other vendors, they only manage uh, any cloud-based service, will manage their own um, kit. And the one that we're interested in is the uh, NetEdit as a management tool. Now, NetEdit unique in a way. Um, it is or does not require SNMP settings to be able to manage uh, CX switches. Uh, it's kind of Aruba Central, if you like, in a sense, on-prem. But uh, NetEdit is a tool that can still use SNMP if they need to manage non-CX platform, including other Aruba switches or third-party uh, devices. So NetEdit is a multi-vendor uh, usage. You can use it uh, uh, to manage multiple types of devices from different vendors and so on and so forth. Okay, so that is said. What Sorry, Nafit. Am, um, am I sharing my screen? Sorry, yeah. there, Nafit. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So, so NetEdit can manage the Cisco and the Juniper as well from the same UI? Well, yes, I never use it that way, but you need to double. Yes, as per the documentation of NetEdit, you can manage any uh, third party device. How far they go, what maps they can read how much they can push, if they can read only, if they can read and write, all of these things are uh, something for me, I have never tried it, yeah? Well, I'll tell you our experience. Oh, go um, ahead, yeah. We turned on the NetEdit server. Uh-huh. And we set the discovery on. Uh-huh. It literally killed our network. <laughs> on the Cisco side. Cisco, yeah, okay. Yeah, it was yeah. sending so much broadcast traffic to Cisco, and literally there was no band, no CPU processing power left in the switches to deal with it. Wow. And it literally brought the whole network to a halt. Wow. Uh, and we were given so many PRTG uh, alerts that uh, this switch is overpowered, this switch is overpowered. So in the end, we just had to disconnect. We had to knock off. So how did completely. you how did you go about to uh, enable discovery? Is an MP? Uh, I can't remember if it was the early days of us getting into HP, oh, but right. um, it did really run, run a havoc. So we had to turn yeah. off our server. We had to just ditch it. That's why I, I delimited or I, I, I preceded my, you know, my statement by saying I have not used it, number one, as they claim. So I don't know exactly how far they go. As you said, this is one customer experience, which is 
uh, maybe I, this is uh, again I can't comment on that this is perfectly this is your own experience perfect it's nice to say this it's not nice but it is nice to me to know it um, but what I'm trying to say I only use NetEdit to manage CX switches that's it I never attempted or thought of having it's I know it makes sense because basically I would rather have one interface to manage everything isn't it right yeah well yeah. but did you need a license for that Course, well, I'm because... sure they bought the license. I was only just learning the stuff, so I didn't yeah. know what they were doing. And all I know that they had to turn off. Oh, that edit. so is it now? Is it now turned on back no. on again? No, no, we haven't turned it back on. Yeah. Because... So are you still using it edit for CX or no? No, I just <laughs> we just do it from the um, from the local secure, interface. Sec secure CRD, really. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So come this on, is like the old on, style. Right. The old style. The old style. Yeah. <laughs> I like the old style. Um, I think, uh, in my view, knitted it with the CX is excellent, and uh, I think you, you're missing. Uh, it, well, if you have a stable environment, because you do the config, you don't keep on creating configuration plans. That's fair enough. But if there are, you know, cases where there's a lot of, um, you know, changes. Um, maybe you support multiple different clients and deploy different projects. Then. It, it might help you doing that yeah but thanks for the comment uh anyway um yeah this is very extremely valid comment in my view because i never experienced uh on non-cx platform yeah thank you sorry nefis uh, uh Tura yeah. here um yeah what's do you, would you know the license to use or the subscription so license yeah so if you look at the documentation license if you manage up to 25 nodes is no license required okay yeah anything above 25 nodes you can i think there are three licenses one three and five years i believe uh, it is subscription based yeah is a node basically classed as like a stack or is it specifically hard hardware devices like if you have six devices in a stack i um, think i think it is individual hardware in yes. India, I'd yeah, yeah, that. yeah 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 the only yeah. Uh, to my knowledge okay because mm. i use multiple uh, the only one that i'm aware of that will uh, not ch would charge per stack not per individual switch mm -hmm. is the airwave the yeah, airwave okay. so when, when you come to central it charges per switch even it sees the stack as a single device vsf uh, still you need individual license for individual members in the stack you might be fooled to think oh i can because you know cx um, um central has its covered device um cx or our power switches they look fine in the stack so if you had stacked it before and you added that as a stack to uh, Central, then it will be added, fair enough. But that will, as far as you can go, if you have not had enough licenses. What will happen in this case, it will be discovered when you create a template group, the template group cannot push, you will generate errors because it says, oh, I cannot recognize the other members. If so, if you have two members and you have only one license, a license for one member, then that would generate errors. So effectively, you can't really push any changes to to the switch. Yeah. So so it is limited for free up to twenty five, and then after yeah. that, it's individual nodes and exactly. you, obviously. So if you have twenty five nodes, twenty five free of charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah up to twenty five should be okay, no problem. Yeah. And is it per year? Is it? Uh, uh, or is I need to double check because I know there were three model, uh, three licenses sold in uh, on Iris. So I need to double check uh, this. I know one, three, and five. They keep on changing, obviously. One year, three years. Oh, so you years. mentioned that. Excuse me, sir. You didn't. No, that's that. fine. But I'll, I'll double check also again because there might be a new update. Yeah. Is there any costs that you might, if, you, if you're doing anything, just maybe? Uh, the cost, uh, let me check. That. I don't know the cost, to be quite honest. Approximate. But... I'm not going to hold in to anybody. I just want to. <laughs> I can't give a figure. Maybe a Yeah, I don't. Maybe 60, 60 per switch. I'm taking yeah. this figure from Central because I'm thinking along the same line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, roughly speaking, give and take. But I'll double check it for you on, in Iris after I finish this. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no worries, mate. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, perfect. Thanks for the interaction. Seems that in it. Oh, by the way, NetEdit there has no. Uh, there has been no announcement for the end of sale EOS for this product. Uh, that's number one. Um, in Central and the CX platform, when you manage CX platform, a lot of functionalities from within NetEdit has been imported into Central for the CX. Uh, I haven't seen it for the Aurora OS. I don't th 
well, CX is the future basically. So they they would they investing heavily in that. So uh, uh, in the net, it, all of its functionality eventually they say will be export imported into or being enabled on Central. Yeah, right. It still exists as a tool, and uh, they, I think there are no plans, at least for the time being, to retire this product. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, I'm just reading from here, non-CX switches. Um, if you need to manage CX switches, two main things, you have to have REST, enable REST API, and SSH. SSH for change validation, remember when I told you this morning, and if you need to make any changes, change, analytics, you know, troubleshooting, all of that is from basically um, REST API, native uh, support. These are kind of the native installation here, which also again, OVA, download it, install it. This, I never seen anything as an appliance. They don't see it as an appliance. That tells you something, I think, yeah? They are not investing into that direction into appliances, i.e. servers and all that stuff. Uh, I think it, that's my gut feeling that NetEdit as a whole functionality will be part of Central integrated. Central will have a new update, I think, soon. As far as I understand, it will be called not Central. You know, the version now is 2.55. There will be Central NG, next generation. So what does that exactly mean? I don't know, but I've heard this news, yeah. Um, to install it, OVF, there's no other way. Now, once you do net edit, you will log in with NE admin. So net NE stands for net edit admin. And the minute you do this, is a, is a, is a Linux based server. And when you do NE admin for the first time, it will immediately prompt you for a new password. You confirm it and they will prompt you for the sudo password once you, meaning uh, super user do. Um, so then they will, uh, run the script automatically so this process happens automatically if you later on need to run the script again they tell you what the script is and where's the path of that script inside so there's a command so do um, python uh, it's a python script basically so the script will run will go through step by step up to 25 or says in here one and three years license so uh, seems there's no five but i'll double check it again for you you will go on and um, you know continue the configuration. By default, it'll pick up an IP address using the ETCP server. Obviously, logically, you will go to static, and you will set it up. First time you log in, you will be admin. So the username for the GUI is not equal to the username for the NE command line. So first time will be admin, and then you will uh, provide no password, and the password you will reset or add a new password to you. Um, there we go. Uh, you can change the password from within NetEdit. For the device discovery, again, we will have had set the devices according to what we want, like SSH, as we said. Uh, we would like to configure um, HTTPS and uh, REST API. So that's done on the device side of things. And then on the NetEdit itself, we will go discover device. Now, the discovery requires two things will require, what we call them credentials, REST, API, uh, and we have SSH. So you're going to provide username, password, according to what you have configured on the switch itself. Once you do this, you are able then to use these credentials and you define the network to map the credentials for. You might have multiple, depends on how many switches you have and how many maybe areas. Um, and then you, you map uh, a network or subnet into these credentials and then you say okay i'm going to use this as a seed device seed device this start the discovery from traditionally historically speaking all management software we as best practice you will go for a core device as a seed because in the core device we have all the vlans all the visibility for the rest of the network you can start from any device and eventually you will get there, but it's much easier and more efficient to start from a core device as a seed device. Once that is discovered, then uh, the seed device will use LLDP neighborhood. Uh, so each device will say LLDP, I see my neighbor, let me tell you about it here. Yeah? So it goes you know, step by step, like I know something I tell you about and so on. Once you have all of these devices discovered, then you are able to monitor the devices and do stuff into that device. One of the key features in my view uh, in NetEdit is kind of, it will 
discover the device, it's going to read the configuration, it's going to see that one as a base config. So I do see this as documentation as well. You can always go and prefer back. It will not tell you or about uh, configuration changes that you have made before discovery. It has no business to do that. It will know all the checkpoints, that's fair enough. But it will tell you that is uh, this is the configuration when I discovered the device. And it will have the initial like configuration. Uh, if any time you change, like even you know, would like to change anything, you create configuration plan based on the current configuration, and then you make changes. So that configuration plan changes will be listed, simply speaking. Once that is the case, uh, you are able to see uh, and make changes. Now, one of the good things about NetEdit, uh, I find it really useful in this, like many other software that are for management, is you can do multi-edit. So let's say I would like, I have five switches. So I'm going to highlight, tick, 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 all of these switches. So I'm going to select all of these switches. And in the configuration, you will find that in the switch, parameters will be shown to you so it, if there is a parameter that is common between switches, let us say host name, and I have three switches in my list. In the host name here, because each switch has a unique host name, it's going to say host name, and then it will be, let's say, uppercase host name. And this uppercase host name is kind of a placeholder, if you like. And it, if you ha if you just hover the mouse over that, uh, you know, upper uppercase host name. It will say on CX1 switch, this is the value. On CX2 switch, this is the value. On CX3 switch, this is the value. You can right click edit and make changes and push it as a configuration plan. If a setting, if any config only exists on one switch, say, let's say I have VLAN 10 on, on, on one switch, VLAN 20 on a different switch, this VLAN will be listed in the config of multi switch config. And they will tell you at the end of the line on which switch is this config does this config exist you can again you can high click and hover the mouse over that specific config say vlan in this case you will find that they will tell you kind of a uh, uh, you know a pop-up screen or whatever they will say okay switch x1 has this ip a vlan and so on and so forth that's another feature a third feature is the auto completion. Okay, so example, I I say I wanted to add another VLAN. So I come at the very end of the page, very very end, and I press coverage return. That's a new line now. I type VLAN one thousand. Press coverage return. Two things here. If you do not intend to have any configuration under the VLAN, you will continue say interface uh, one slash one slash one. Uh, NetEdit will see this one as a new command. If you think, or if you want to do any sub config or configuration underneath the context of the VLAN 1000 in our case, you will have to use a space bar or a tab, i.e. indentation. The second you do indentation, NetEdit will immediately know your intention is to do configuration in under that context. And so this is one the second thing. And what will happen actually, NetEdit is extremely clever, will take the VLAN immediately to the section where the VLANs are, will put them in the proper order. So if they have VLAN 10, 20, and you added VLAN 15 at the very end of the line, it's going to take up VLAN 15 instead of between 10 and 20. And you're still there, you start doing, you know, editing, but it will rearrange it to the, uh, and put it in the right section for you to see. So there's no mumbo jumbo. There's no really nonsense stuff. It will rearrange stuff to, according to, uh, you know, whether where that feature is located inside the switch. It's really, really great feature is, uh, and, and in that sense is really, really very efficient indeed. Um, you can edit a single device, you can edit multiple devices if you would like to. Um, one of the other features available and good about NetEdit is, let us say I create changes, um, multiple VLANs, and you can create your own. So what will happen, there will be what's called validation check. So natively, 
net edit will do validation check on your command. So from syntax perspective, if there's an error, they will flag an error. If there's a warning, for example, it will say uh, this warning. Um, and will, and if there's an error, it will not push the conflict to the switch. So they will do syntax checks, okay? You can create your own conditions and force it. Before, so you're gonna force a check against some set, set conditions. So example, I might have different locations, but my policy says that my company policy says every single uplink has to be described. You can't just leave an uplink without description. So you go and you put this one as part of your validation test, and you might say, okay, if an uplink is not uh, described, what am I going to do? Should I say this is error or should I say this is warning? If I say this is an error and I try to push the config, they will never push the config because there are errors in the configuration. Even though it is not an error, it is um, just something missing. It's still, because you define that one as an error, because this is your policy. You might say, okay, if I don't, if somebody doesn't describe the uplink, I will warn them. Uh, please go back and just double check. So when you try to commit the changes, when you try to deploy before committing, when you try to deploy, a warning comes up. I say, okay, listen, you forgot to do the uplink description. Can you please do it? According to a text that you, you configured. If the user choose to ignore that warning, I say, okay, I don't care. I'm going to just commit the changes. It will accept it because that's not an error, okay? So you decide what is an error, what is not an error in this case. So you do, you can create your own validation. This is not called syntax validation because you can have, this is, we call this one semantic validation, yeah? So it is the logic that you would like to build into your network, making sure you have consistency across the board. Everyone is doing the same. So there is no discrepancy in the configuration anywhere on any device. So this is something that is part of the, or a feature in NetEdit. There are a lot of features in NetEdit, actually, you can utilize them um, as well. NetEdit can also integrate with the mobile app, if, uh, as I said to you at the beginning of the day, so we can have NetEdit integrated in mobile, or the mobile app rather than uh, integrate NetEdit, and NetEdit will be able to interact with that mobile app with no problems. And absolutely, there are some features in this mobile app I can integrate. Um, it's really, really um, interesting because this is something that you can do from your mobile uh, quite easy um, with no problems whatsoever. This is as far or as much as I would like to talk about NetEdit. There are lot, a lot more than this, uh, but I leave it to you in the lab to, to try different things. And um, actually, the lab will explain a few things. I made, um, I created the lab for you to make sure that at least you go over the basics and um, it should work and there shouldn't be a problem, hopefully, if you have configured correct settings on the switch and correct settings on the net edit itself, you should be able to discover the devices and uh, work on it. Still, we have enough time. Uh, probably you are still in the previous labs, but um, I would like you to try knit edit. Um, I'm very interested in knit edit as well. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pause. So the last topic today I would like to discuss is stacking technology. Now this is not in depth discussion of stacking technology. Again, um, I'll just cover what does it mean to us and uh, the context in the context of uh, our switches, the one we're using. Um, they are there to support VSX. <clears throat> so we'll focus a little bit at the end on the VSX stacking. So stacking technology is when you bring multiple, two or more switches together, so they behave a little bit different. So we create a virtual entity. So it's like virtual switching. Um, there's another type of, of technology that uh, divides the switch into smaller context switching. So it's the other way around. So one switch will be divided to multiple switches. Now, we don't have to go that way because we use VRF anyway. VRF is kind of um, isolation of entities within the switch itself. Um, Cisco used to call it uh, multiple device context, VDC, actually virtual device context. And we had similar technology to that in uh, Comware. We used to call it MDC, 
multiple device context. That's different. That's stacking the other way around. We we start with a smaller and we end with a bigger virtualized entity. So to try to explain to you um, what does stacking mean to us, we need to understand the switch has what's so called operation planes, three different planes, like any a switch in the world or any of these devices, network devices, control, management, and data. Okay. Control is a result of certain applications or certain APIs running uh, on the switch. So things like Mac tables or tables in general are a result of something. We run OSPF, we come with a routing table. That's the control plane, basically. We run, um, you know, segmentation, we come with the uh, Mac table and we come up table, um, we have all of these database tables. So all of these things are also called control plane. Eventually the data will follow based on the control plane. So they say data and, or forwarding plane and control plane are tightly controlled or tightly coupled. There are some exceptions, obviously, if you run things like uh, BGP, then you have a lot of capability to define the, um, you know, the entries in the table based on attributes um, and so on, yeah. But that's how it is. So control tables, then data will follow. Management is, as the name uh, it says, what's, it is what it says. Um, if I need to SSH to the switch, then that's management, isn't it? If I need to HTTPS, that's management and so on. And that's also called management plane. Okay. So the logic here, basically, when I stack, I will stack the two switches in general, I say, um, when we say single control plane stacking, it means I am able to generate a single control plane that the switches look as if they are single entity. And the control plane is what dictates how the data is forwarded. And the control plane is, when I say single or dual control plane, it means either single table or tables or dual tables. So in dual control plane, uh, stacking that can you stack only two uh, devices you will have two routing tables two mac tables um so basically that that kind of technology is um is only um from perspective of link aggregation as a single um, entity for for the outside world yeah so when it comes to stack technology is we, when you merge the switches together so this is what's so called kind of a virtual switch and we have centralized control and management plane independent data planes obviously data plane will always be forwarded according to the tables um, it doesn't really matter because um, i can manage the whole switches from one interface i will be able to generate one routing table for example but then data is based on the localized isn't it um, so each switch will be in charge of forwarding their own data but also according to the control uh, plane Distributed data plane and distributed uh, link aggregation here. And they try to um, have a case um, of a lag on a single switch. If switch one fails, server one loss is lost because we are relying on a single switch. In this case, if you are really concerned about redundancy and availability, obviously you would like to stack on multiple physical entities. And if this is a single control plane stacking, we have a loop, but we don't need any loop prevention mechanism. Um, when it comes to our rubber platforms, we have two different kind of platforms, if you like. Uh, the single control plane stacking in this context, VSF, that is applicable to 2930F and 5400 V3, which is uh, R. And these are the legacy switches. Um, our OS base, and these are the CX6300 model and 60 uh, F and M. Obviously, when this slide was produced, 6200 wasn't available in the market. 6200 as well supports VSF, so these two. Right, um, so the VSF, we will have a VSF link. Now, VSF, they call it non, uh, VSF can span long distances. VSF can span long distances. Um, there is no specific module that you need to have for the VSF stack. Though on the CX switches, <clears throat> you have to stack onto on specific interfaces. There are 10 gig plus interfaces, 
which are called SFB, um, uh, you know, 56 ports. And these are the ones, 25, 50 gig, uh, 100, if it depends on the switch model. But you can stack on these um, interfaces, but we can run as long as the cable can run, basically. If you have fiber, single mode fiber, you can run, just let us be realistic. Maybe the stack is crossing two buildings, okay? Spans two buildings, that's fair enough, okay? Even in theory, it can span even much longer than that. For the VSIP stack is not really on one area only. We have a member, so member one here, that plays a massive role here. And it is the uh, conductor, so, if you like. Sorry, just to confirm here. So, you know, the way like in old Cisco, so we just had a stacking cable at the back, and then you could just run the length of the cable. But here you're saying that we can run through the fiber ports on the side to whatever length the fiber can go. Yes. Up to, of course, certain distance. Up yeah. to the, what, what, yeah. one kilometer, whatever the fiber can, a single mode can go. Correct. So <clears throat> the Cisco one, we call this is stack-wise cable, isn't it, right? Yeah. Uh, equivalent to that, we do support something similar. We call backplane stacking, but different platform. So backplane stacking is supported on 3810 platform, which is, again, um, this is uh, our robot switches as well as on 2930M, okay? They require a specific module. Obviously, in terms of capacity, that would definitely give you more capacity, backplane capacity, because you can have, for this, you can go up to even 160 gigabit per second links between the switches, depends on the module or you insert at the back. But, um, and that's restricted to a cabinet because you can run it, I think, maximum five meters, it depends, or three meters. So that's is what they call, we call this one cabinet technology or enclosure technology. You have to be the same location nearly. Uh, while the VSF, yes, you can run. If you ever have had exposure to Comware switches, we had something called RF, Intelligent Resilient Framework, which is similar in that sense to VSF. You can run as long as the cable can go. Yeah? Yeah. So the statement, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. <clears throat> in here, you're you're showing an uh, an architecture of a daisy chain, and this is incorrect. Yeah. So, if the secondary went down, obviously, would you need two VS links, one from the member to the primary and to the secondary? So, like, you know, I agree with you, hundred percent. So, basically, this is not the only supported model, if you like, of connectivity. <clears throat> you can have ring ring, ring. topology. Yeah, ring <coughs> something like this. Yeah, so yeah. that's what you'd have basically. It was oh, yeah, that's typical, yeah, yeah. definitely. Right, 100%. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. okay. I just want. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, as I'm, I said, I'm actually, um, sorry, I'm actually trying to imagine how would we create a ring topology of a VSF stack like in two different locations. So run oh, one. <laughs> I just can't get my head around it. So if you have more than two, two no, no, and okay, if you have fiber, two, so you, you you talk about two now, yeah. If you have I say to, more than two, if it will run on a fiber, so that would be a bit of a job. It is, yeah. Well, I mean, it depends, again, what we're trying to achieve here, basically. Um, you need to think about the practicality of this. Is it practical mm. to do this or not? And it depends on the location of the switches. Is it possible technically? Yes. But is it practical? Then it depends on the situation. Probably not. Yes. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Yes. Yeah. Um, maybe if you have the switches not far away from each other, and you have the SFP 56 port, like say 25 gig. You might want yeah. to have. <coughs> yeah, well, the one uh, that could be currently running is running of the DAC cables. The DAC cable, yeah, exactly. In so DAC cable of the uh -huh. of, in the ring topology. Exactly. So there we go. So you that is feasibly possible. But if you really think of running multiple buildings and other stuff, it becomes restricted uh, because of you know physical layout and uh, practicality of running multiple cables. Um, you would normally run a ring and you would like to have re so redundancy from physical perspective where well, well, these cables are running on different conduits and multiple different considerations obviously again depends how critical it is what's the likelihood one of these switches will fail and can you sustain a failure and is the customer okay with that for five six hours whenever and then we can replace the switch so again you have to s judge the situation but we say what is possible, what's not possible, and what's practical, what's not practical, yeah.
Perfect. That cable is very common, obviously. Yeah, exactly. If you have two switches, obviously you can't run. Uh, ring doesn't run on two switches. So what to do in this case? If you only have two, two switches, right? What to what are you gonna do? What do you normally go? <laughs> you ha you will have link aggregation, and then uh, you can run the uh, the stack of the link ring um, the lag basically. Yeah. Okay. So uh, full mesh is not supported. Um, the older switches, there are certain model of switches, which is the thirty eight ten. Uh, thirty eight ten switch uh, support full uh, full mesh. Only five switches in the stack. But that's the older one, so we don't really talk about this one. And that's a backplane stacking as well. Right. We're focusing on the VSF. What are the requirements for the VSF? CX version uh, 10.4 higher. They run the same version. Uh, only 6,300 models of, um, can form a stack, can combine models, different models. Um, only one, obviously with a new update, uh, 6,200 also, they can do stack. Uh -huh. Only. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> can I ask you a question here now? Yeah, go ahead. If I can answer that word. <laughs> okay. So let's say I have 6300 switch and I'm running on version 10.7. So I've graded to format 10.7. Mm -hmm. And I want to add a, a one into, into the current stack. And that's running on version 10.4. Now, do I have to upgrade the firmware on a second switch to 10.4? seven or can i just add it in the stack and somehow the the master Magically. will send it Mag no okay i understand what you say um my knowledge says no okay it means that there's no an automatic uh process that the master says oh i look at this um you know the member say here's different version let me upgrade that member to my version is not i think that is a feature that would be uh, in my view that is a very important feature because we had on the Arba OS switches, if you have a different uh, operating system, it will give you a warning, mismatch operating system. Just to let you know, I'm going to say, I'm gonna say oh, I'll just to let you know, the system, we're running two different versions, but I'm going to upgrade that. That's not a problem. Don't worry about it. That doesn't happen right now as we speak. Um, it doesn't happen now. Maybe in the future, maybe, I don't know. But no, okay. there's no magic way to do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so only single VSF link using regular thing. Um, so also I need to update on this. So what is going on uh, or uh, in version two? I think we, what version you're running? The latest is more than 10.7, I think 10.10 now. 10.9, I, 9, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yes, I, yes. I haven't done any 10.10. .10. No. Okay, there has been uh, nice few features, but I don't know whether VSF is part of the updates. I'll need to double check that, but uh, you have to keep that in mind. Uh, if you have a localized switches, definitely I will go for the DAC interface. That's definitely no doubt in my mind. Yeah, uh, DAC cable. Um, now for the members, uh, show interface brief. You can clearly see members are numbered like two, three, four, and so on. And uh, actually, to confirm to what you have in your, uh, they have a DAC cable on this output. Yeah. Right, so to do the configuration, so this is the result. So this is, or oh, these are switches that are uh, are there basically um, being stacked. Um, but to start, before you start stacking, what do you need to do? You would dictate one of them will be the master. Okay, so the conductor, whatever, in charge of this. So you're going to say member one and link one, one slash one slash 27. All good and nice. Perfect. Come here on the standby. You say member one, you will configure the link. You renumber it, reboots. This link will change to two because the number or the member has changed from one to two. And once you do this, simply speaking, the uh, other switch will uh, sense a stack um, and then it will join uh, that is, uh, automatically. You can also pre-provision, meaning you can say, okay, if you discover this type, uh, then I will make it member four, right? So there we go now, the switch, because 6300 is the only switch family now um, uh, that can combine different models. 
different part numbers basically yeah and uh, so i might say okay if you discover any of these whatever make this one port and member four so when that gets connected it will reboot and then it becomes member number four um how is the traffic handled in the stack quite interesting isn't it because we have multiple types of traffic so number one unicast unicast members are forwarded um, you know members use forwarding table as usual if destination on to a different member use the fs link and then user can traffic can traverse other ways if members no problem so if i need to tra to send to destination as per what you see on the screen then i will use vsf link no problem now that's okay here if you talk about this stack that is connecting um, you know like link aggregation here does not use the hash really really nice and important they try as much as they possibly can to avoid loading the stack link so this stack link or the link uh, for that stack will uh, they try to minimize the load of that link they will ignore they will not use a hash the hash says oh go and use link number one go and use link number two prefer local link to avoid the vsf link if there is no other option but to use the vsf link they will use that link okay so that's really uh, something uh, important to understand if i have a member failure what happens losing a device affects OS if neighbors of course because when i lose a device then interfaces will be different some of these interfaces will become down and so on secondary member is recommended we know this but the concept here if i lose a member then i would like to make sure that um, a graceful restart is enabled yeah uh, the reason for this one uh, during the convergence during the convergence uh, i would like to keep as much as i possibly can the relationship and the records that do not have to change that's the concept of graceful restart and it, the switch will update itself according to the new interfaces available but it will not tear down the relationship between the um, you know the old stack member two and the uh, other members or other uh, you know um, neighbors outside the stack if you have this if link failure which is something that you mentioned even though now in this example uh, you have ring topology so we have both rings uh, been uh, for some reason uh, down then that will uh, result in something called uh, brain, uh, brain split or stack split um, the reason, obviously, uh, say, for example, to outside world, these are two, uh, one entity, but internally, they are really separate. So in this case, they will implement what's so-called multi-active device detection. And for short, short for this one is MAD. Um, MAD is multi-active detection. So basically, it's going to say, okay, I'm going to find out if my, because I lost communication with my master. I'm going to say, okay, I don't see my master. Is it because the master is down or is it because the VSF link is down? So there are two ways to do it uh, using out of band management. So these out of band management ports will, uh, will broadcast the detection protocol. And if they get a response back, then they know that the master is up and that will not really become a master. What happens? What happens at the standby? Think of this one like lose election say okay i don't see my my primary my master i'm going to shut down my interfaces that are connecting to any link aggregation or they can use the link aggregation uh, in this case um, so they will piggyback on the uh, lacp data unit and they will send um, you know detection for the peer on top of that so that is a single control plane stacking and very nutshell, if you like. Uh, if you compare this one to the VSX stack, VSX stack being a dual control plane stacking, disabled by default, and it's for high availability. Now, you can, uh, in the VSX different than VSF, because you did ask about the operating system firmware, you can run two different operating system firmware. And I think the concept here is for zero downtime, um, uh, continuous forwarding, meaning uh, in the VSX, VSX stack, I can upgrade a member and 
not really having problems with the when the upgraded member comes back online uh, with the different versions of the firmware that shouldn't be a problem whatsoever um, if you look logically about um, at you know that these two technologies you're going to see VSX uh, looks like two different switches completely except from the link you know Ethernet links like that will help form link aggregation uh, while the VSF basically is a single control plane, single data plane, uh, data planes are distributed by single control and management uh, plane. Um, where do you use them? You can use them. Well, so if you think about the deployment uh, paradigm, we think about uh, here, these are the edges normally. See, I mentioned this, right? This is Cisco, this is Comware. The bottom one is Comware. And this one is Cisco. Virtual chassis, okay. All of these are similar to single control plane stacking. VPC, MLAG is what BSX is similar to. These are dual control plane stacking. Um, so there we go here. Um, the virtualization, VSF plug and play is very simple to configure. Uh, BSX is different. What I mean by different in, in what sense? In many aspects. Because things like you can you can dictate what you would like to replicate between the switches. For example, uh, a stacked VSX stack switches do not automatically, by default, say uh, propagate VLANs across the switches. So if I create a VLAN one member, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that VLAN will be synchronized to the other member. You can select you can select what is to synchronize. What is to leave not synchronized? So it is opt in kind of, um, uh, you know, opt in means you are opt out uh, till you define what feature you would like to include in the synchronization. Um, ideal for campus uh, aggregation core, or you can use it obviously for in a data center. That's uh, absolutely uh, no problem. Um, you can think of uh, dual control plane stacking, it has a lot of benefits also. So control plane, dual control plane for better resiliency. You are not relying on each other. Unified management uh, synchronization. You can um, you can choose the features to synchronize, what features not to synchronize. Distributed. So from the lag perspective, this is good and perfect. That's the whole concept. Um, we had an old technology on uh, 5400. We used to call it uh, DT, distributed trunk, LACP. Okay, similar in a way to this. And the main, the main purpose for that was to do link aggregation between the two switches and the external entity. Um, link, um, the three links are completely separate from each other. Um, Active Gateway, if you think about, let us say I have an end device that needs to communicate with its default gateway. You must come back to me and say, listen, Nafit, this is nonsense because if this is my, if this is distribution layer switch and I would like to make these my default gateways for my clients, then I'm in a big trouble here. And I'm going to ask why. You're going to say, okay, no problem. I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. Because, you, because I said these are two different control planes. If I have VLAN 10 here, surely the VLAN 10 interface has different IP than the VLAN 10 interface here. And I would say, yes, 100%. That is definitely correct. But what is the solution to this is what's so called Active Gateway. Similar to VRP, HSRP business, similar in concept wise, yeah? Or similar, let's say, on the, uh, uh, in result wise, yeah? But uh, operate completely differently. And, you know, HSRP, VRP, we call it next hop virtualization, isn't it? Um, so, um, Active Gateway is I'm going to create a virtual entity, virtual IP address that will be used as the client default gateway. And I will configure both of these switches with that virtual IP address. So no matter which device will pick up that uh, traffic. So for example, I send the traffic from here and according to the switch, I'm going to use this link. And um, the current in VLAN 10 will pick up the virtual IP address on this switch, no problem. Another client might, the hash might say, go and use this link. 
then if I have configured or um, enabled the active gateway, then that's not a problem because the virtual IP here will take care of that. If you think about uh, from the perspective of lag, for example, multi. Sorry, Nafi. So, what you're saying is um, so if you have a VLAN 10, mm -hmm. so the SVI will have a different IP on one switch and a different IP. On, of and and yeah. then you'll have an active gateway that will be the common IP on both switches. Exactly. Correct. So, so when the frame comes in and it just looks at the active gateway rather than the it doesn't matter which link is used is going to use like in this example because that's mm. link aggregation whether you use link number one to the first switch or link number two to the second switch because both of them are configured with that virtual gateway ip address mm -hmm. they will process the, the request and without any uh, without any need to go over any link to other switch okay and the active gateway will be the one in the routing table or the core if there was any core Oh, um, oh, so on the, on, the, on the routing table, the active gateway will not be the one in the routing table. Will be, uh, will be the, phys the physical IP will be the one in the routing table for each individual switch, right? But the active gateway is a mechanism if you like to process that request and take it to the physical IP of that interface. Yeah? Okay. Um. Which is similar to, again, different. We know that it's different to VRP, HSRP stuff, right? um okay. yeah uh because let me just remind you of one fact here the version table let us say the vsx stack is communicating upwards you know uh, northbound uh, with these guys these guys see physical ip addresses right uh, and to and if uh, they can come here or come there right and, and there's something called active forwarding which is similar to next um uh, active gateway but um that will be based on the MAC address rather than the IP address. So, yeah. Okay, two super routing tables, again, the same the same case. Um, multi chassis link lag. Uh, again, we did talk about this one. And uh, from the link aggregation perspective, it looks like the one on the right-hand side, so number two. So physically, you are number one. Logically, you are number two. So um, this is something that the link aggregation perspective sees that. Um, probably, in the you know, lastly, we'd like to look at the some components. Just give some definitions. I think we did give some definitions, but to put everything in perspective, we need to look at all of these definitions, roughly speaking. Um, probably, so active for so an active gateway. We know what that is. Um, keep alive mechanism is for split brain stuff. Right, so this is a mechanism to make sure if there's something happens between the two switches and they lose the VSX link, then you will have, um, um, you know, keep alive is like a heartbeat stuff, right? Um, ISL link, ISL link is the actual the main link in this case. We call that one in the VRF um, and VSF. We call VSF link, but we don't call it that. And this it operates differently. ISA link um, is between the two switches. And as per best practice, if you download the document for best practice, you will uh, notice that they say the best practice for this is to be link aggregation. Um, active forwarding is the southbound traffic from the top. So you have routing relationship between the core, say, and the distribution. If the core return traffic that is, say, a traffic from here used this link and the return traffic using the other link, now, if you leave everything as is without active forwarding, things will work. But what will happen, according to the routing table on this switch, it will say, oh, this guy should go to the other member. So they will forward the traffic on the VSX link. Active forwarding is to minimize the traffic forwarding on the VSX link, and each one of them will say, "Okay, I will have, I will act on behalf of my of my friend." Yeah, so I'm gonna for that uh, specific uh, IP or network of VLAN, we will share the MAC address. So I'm gonna have my my neighbor MAC address, and he will have my also my MAC address. So basically, if the traffic comes to itself or to its neighbor. 
it has these MAC addresses, its neighbor and itself, to be able to process the request that is coming south uh, on any link. That's active um, active forwarding. Link up delay. Um, imagine a case whereby the switch, uh, say, rebooted uh, for, say, because the switch has its firmware upgraded. What will happen to the switch in this case? The switch will have to build the tables, routing table, MAC table, op table, and so on. Imagine if the switch links come up straight away, what will happen? Traffic will open, so the links to the down the southbound would be opened here because the link is up. And this switch might immediately for some traffic that will cause some of the traffic to be dropped because of the unavailability yet. There it, has had, it hasn't had enough time to build the tables. So link up delay, link up delay is to make sure um, we give a bit of time for the links uh, before, before the links come up uh, for, the, for the switch to build up the tables. That's what exactly we would like to have uh, link up delay for. Yeah, so I think pretty much that's what I want to talk about in the VSX. There are a lot more components, a lot of more details. We cover these details in the official course that we run normally because we have enough time. And we normally spend on VSX nearly two hour, uh, one and a half hours explaining the technology itself and then show some examples and so on. But here, again, it's just kind of um, a touch the service kind of approach. And uh, that's about the VSX. Right. Um, I think that's that should mark the end of the 